Hello, it's Minty again. I am day five, day six, day five, day six, post-op um, for semicircular canal dehiscence. Um, I should say it's superior semicircular canal dehiscence. It's a mouthful, but um, today I wanted to just do a little video about if plugging the semicircular canal is really the best option for this type of a condition. Um, obviously, I didn't want to have my when you when you plug your semicircular canal, you have dizziness issues and stuff like that. So obviously, nobody wants to do that. But um, I had asked my surgeon, you know, five years ago when I was first looking into the surgery, um, is there any way we can just patch the hole because that's the what that's what's causing the the um, autophony and the the problems is there's a hole in your semicircular canal and my surgeon at the time had said uh, he said that it's um, hard to get the a patch to stay um, and I kept waiting and waiting because I thought you know maybe there'll be some new something come out new technology come out that can make it so we can you know, they can fix this in a less uh, difficult way, in a way that's not going to be so such a long recovery, because the recovery for the plugging the semicircular canal is six to eight weeks of recovery, and that's not able to drive for that long. And so I was really hesitant to do the surgery, and I waited for five years, like I said, before I finally decided that this was worth it. Um, and just to give you kind of a idea of the, the size of the semicircular canal, the superior semicircular circular canal, I made this little teeny knot here, or a little, little loop, and it's about six millimeters in diameter. Um, and the tube, the actual canal, is probably going to be... Um, a little bit thicker than this piece of string but I don't know if you can tell but so this is the size of the semicircular canal it's teeny and the superior semicircular canal actually goes up a little bit into the brain uh, cavity usually um, there's a lot of like spongy looking bone between the brain and the nasal and, and ear canals and all that stuff and so this little teeny piece of superior canal um, extends up into like the the base of the brain um, bone, I guess. And for a surgeon to successfully patch the hole, uh, usually they have to actually go into the cranium, uh, cut a hole, and they have to go in and find the spot that is you know, where, where there's the little teeny hole that's probably the size of a, you know, a pen uh, hole or, or a pen tip. I'm going to carefully get my, my dog. She always has to be with me and she would just scratch the door. So I, as you can see, I am still recovering. I cannot turn my head very easily without being super dizzy. Anyway, back to the topic. So a surgeon would have to go in and uh, find the hole first, find the canal first of all, and find the hole and successfully patch the hole perfectly to make it so there is not a problem anymore. And that's in a environment where it's, it's slick, you know, there's fluid everywhere. And to get a patch to really fit is the trick um, and I don't know I I haven't researched extensively but I know that there is some possible um, technologies like uh, 3d printing bone and stuff like that that could potentially help but it's still a tricky spot to get to and a tricky spot to image and to get the perfect patch for and to make it stay so the way my surgeon uh, 
ex explain it to me, is that really the best fix right now is what he believes is actually plugging that semicircular canal. So it would be like putting a little patch in this, um, in a tube, like so sticking, I don't know, it's tiny. And I, it's amazing that they can even do this, but so they, he drilled in, was able to find the semicircular canal, and then he fills it in with, I think it's like little pieces, like dust, a bone, bone dust, and also glue and, and stuff like that too. And then it fills in the, that very fragile, fragile canal to um, make it so that it's not gonna break again. And so you don't have to do a repeat surgery and so that was the, what I finally had decided to do. But man, I tell you, this little teeny um, loop <laughs> is such a small, fragile thing and has such a huge impact on a person. And man, it just blows my mind um, that so much, you know, five years of... Uh, hearing myself talking really loud in my head and uh, dizziness sometimes and loudness and headaches and just um, wanting to avoid people. It was hard <laughs> to deal with that. Um, but I did um, know that I wanted to do the surgery sometime, but I had a newborn at the time and I just knew it was going to be so hard for me to take care of this newborn if I did the surgery. So that's why I waited for five years and I was hoping that there would be some more technology or something come out that would make it less invasive and less uh, recovery time and everything. But I finally bit the, bit the dust, or not bit the dust, but I finally decided to do the surgery. And um, yesterday was really hard. I was incredibly dizzy. Um, most of the day it felt like, you know, when you're a kid and you spin around, and then you stop and, and things are still kind of dizzy. You're, you're, you're still kind of spinning a teeny bit inside. Um, it felt like that all the time, like all day mostly. Um, today it's a little bit feeling like that, I, but I feel it feels a little bit better. So like I said, it's day six. Yeah, it's five, five, six, whatever. I lose track. I had surgery on Monday. Today it's Saturday. And I am doing a little better today, but things are still a little bit tipsy and I am still a long ways from being fully recovered. So, um, but anyway, I wanted to explain that because it's kind of confusing to um, most people, I think, unless you kind of study this a little bit more. If you do know something that I don't know, please feel free to comment below. Um, and share any wisdom or research or resources that you have uh, heard about. And also, if you have anything that helps with nausea, uh, let me know. I think that's what my next video will be about. And I'll talk to you later. Bye.